Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to thank Ediseo uh, for hosting this meeting. This is a great meeting. Uh, it's always great to, to be in front of, of uh, people in the feed industry as well as interacting with, with suppliers like this. This is probably uh, one of the best companies that, that we get to work with around the world. Um, before I get started, <clears throat> I want to ask you a couple questions. One is, how many of you are using uh, a platform based on the Cornell model? Okay. Uh, INRA? Feed into milk? Uh, the Dutch system? <laughs> the German system? <laughs> we have a smart ass up front. Um, they're longtime customers, so I know what he's actually doing, and he'll say whatever he wants. Uh, before I actually get into it, I could talk about everything that's in the Cornell model, how we implement things, uh, but there's, I'm taking a slightly different track with this. We'll, we'll talk some about the model, but we're also going to talk about uh, how we actually can improve our implementation of any system uh, by looking at some specific inputs and such. But before I, before I even go to the next slide, I, I realized last, late last night that I forgot a slide. And it is probably, to me, the most important slide uh, that I should have in every presentation. Uh, so I'm just going to start drawing it quick here. And they're probably going to yell at me that I'm getting too far away from the microphone. But they will live. Uh, <laughs> Several years ago, I did some calculations just to look at how much energy does, do these cows metabolize every day versus humans. And, and if we take a human male at 100 kilos of body weight at maintenance, so not really exercising a lot, just kind of a, kind of like me, kind of a slug, okay? And when I actually did this slide, did these calculations, I weighed 100 kilos. Uh, that was before I quit smoking and spent more time in the office, so I would have to change it to higher than that. But basically, a human male at maintenance is going to metabolize about 25 <clears throat> kcals of energy per kilo of body weight. OK, that's our base. If we take, they, they've actually put data loggers on football players and measured their energy metabolism during a football match. And if we look at the energy that they're metabolizing during a match, it's about 60 kcals. So here we've got these guys out there running like mad for three hours this kind of energy metabolism. Then they take a couple days off and everyone considers them a hero and they get paid ungodly sums of money. But if we look at a cow that's producing 37 to 40 kilos of milk, she's metabolizing 100 kcals per kilo of body weight. If we put them under different stresses, higher temperatures, more walking, She can be upwards of 110 kcals per kilo of body weight. Folks, these animals are amazing athletes. We basically expect that cow to run a marathon and play a full football game every day. So we really, when we think about the efficiency of these cows, we really need to keep in mind that we need to do everything we can to make her as comfortable as possible, keep her cool, and feed her appropriately. For a long time, we've always looked at amino acids as additives. And I think it's, it should be pretty clear after the, t the talks yesterday, especially Chuck's and Phil's, about how amino acids are they're required nutrients. 
But for us to really to take advantage of how we formulate, we have to spend a little bit of extra time on getting some data inputs correct. So before we get into that though, I, I always start slides like this because when I tell people I'm from New York, the first thing that everyone says is, oh, I love that city. Okay, I'm 51 years old. I've lived in upstate New York my entire life. With the exception of going through the airports and driving through the city to get to a wedding on Long Island, I've never been to the city. It is as different where I live as being in Paris versus where we were last night, okay? So if we look at see, where I live, I live in the red dot. And if we zoom in to that red dot, you can see we start to have all sorts of lakes. We have four true seasons. New York State's the four, third or fourth largest dairy producing state in the country. We have about 650,000 cows. And we have lots and lots of water. So we're dealing with some pretty, especially larger farms, we have some pretty strict environmental regulations. We zoom in some more, there's the dairy I'm a, a partner on. We're nine, uh, 800 cows, and we actually live in a, the farms in a valley. So this, this ground down here, it's actually on an aquifer, and we, we have, we can get 200 millimeters of rainfall and be out doing primary tillage work the next day. But that water supply, all the water, that aquifer also supplies the water for about 60,000 people. Uh, and our last field is about 50 meters from the village wellhead. So we're, we're, we're watched pretty closely. Uh, pretty simple operation of this barn's actually been extended. So this is lactating cows, whoops, dry cows and heifers in, the, in our feed storage system manure storage uh, because of environmental regs there's another big pond here for uh, runoff from the bunk silo complex uh, the original facility was actually built in 1995 i started working with the farm when i was in extension in 1997 and i did most of my phd actually on this farm uh, implementing commercial quality control systems so all based off of six sigma on this farm, uh, it was it was quite interesting. Uh, just a quick shot of, of our wean calves, and then I started generating this graph. We, we've recorded kilos of milk shipped per cow all the way back to '97. I took this graph. I started this graph January 1st of 2000, and you can see there's there's variation uh, within year. 2x to 3x, and then these drops, everyone says it's heat stress, but it's not. It's when we would start feeding fresh corn silage. So watching graphs like this, using historical data, and then using the model, we started to see that we were losing a lot of opportunity, we were losing a lot of milk. So we've always have used the model as part of decision making uh, decision making tool to do what ifs. If we change this, if we change when we start feeding corn silage, what, what will it do for us in terms of milk production over the next year? So that, that allowed us to, to uh, change our, our feeding, our storage strategy, uh, some things related to overcrowding, poor forage quality. Uh, you can see all the good, the bad, and the ugly that goes on on the, on the dairy. All of this has been based off the model, a lot of the, most of these decisions. And, and I just want to be clear that this is not a new model. Uh, this model actually started to be developed uh, in the mid to late 1980s. Uh, and the first real release that, that people could get their hands on was in 1991. Uh, and in 1992, uh, they started to develop CPM dairy to be the first real commercial application to do formulation based on this system. I've been working with it since 1990 uh, when I started my master's, and that was the same year I got married. 
So we're 29 years later, and I'm, I'm still involved with both the model and my wife. <sighs> and I tell people, you know, there, there's days that I wonder if I'm married to my wife and the model is my mistress, or if I'm married to my wife and the model's my mistress. And, and the true answer to that question is, it depends on the day. <laughs> Back in 2005, when everyone was starting to retire, the, the original fathers of the model, uh, we were given the opportunity uh, to become a spin-off out of a spin-out out of Cornell. Uh, three of us left and started AMTS. Uh, we're still tightly in, in relationship with, with Cornell, with especially Mike Van Amberg, who's in charge of developing the model at Cornell. Uh, so as there's new biology, new things that are done, uh, we, we communicate back and forth uh, with Mike quite a bit on how we're going to actually implement this in the field. So how do we implement this in the field? Well, one of the first things is communication is critical uh, when we're implementing this on farm. Uh, it, and it's not just from the model from doing day-to-day -day formulations but it's also doing these what-if scenarios. Uh, we, we can do some really wonderful things, for example, comparing ground corn versus expanded corn. What impact is that change in processing, that change in starch availability, going to do to our overall formulation strategy? Uh, and this is both from the standpoint of, of how we function within AMTS, but also how the farms really have to function to take full advantage of what we do with formulation. And that's both basic formulation to get proteins and, 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 and carbohydrates correct, but also when we start looking at going to, the going to the next level and implementing amino acids, implementing different fatty acid strategies, whatever, is that these farms have to have this commitment to continuously improve. Because when we look at, when we make a change on farm, there's some changes we'll see immediately or within two weeks. But to really, with most of these nutritional changes, these higher end changes, it may take a year for us to see the full benefit of that change that we made. I, I jokingly ask audiences, how long does it take for you to determine if this nutritionist is good? I've had dairy farmers say, ha, oh, two weeks. I'm like, oh, yeah, no, let's, let's be real. Most people will say six months, maybe 12 months. But in reality, if we're going to touch every system in the dairy, it's going to take us three years to really see the true impact of what that nutritionist is doing with that farm. That, because that's how long it'll take us to start from the baby calf all the way through to those heifers are through their first lactation. So they have to, there has to be this commitment for consistency and continuous improvement. So let's start with this. And Phil, when Phil threw this slide up yesterday, I was about ready to, to jump up and down and say, you SOB, you stole my slide. Uh, because we get into some, what is a mathematical model? And all we're trying to do is take this data that has been studied and then try to do these mathematical relationships. So this is, this is just one example. This is one equation out of the model. And that is, how do we get to predicting total nitrogen excretion? And in this case, it's a really good relationship with crude protein where as protein intake increases, the total amount of nitrogen excretion increases as well. So in this case, it, it's a very tight relationship and this is an acceptable equation. But when we throw this one up and we look at the relationship between milk production and crude protein of diets, okay, yeah, we can fit a line to it. But when you look at within the 16% diet range, they go from 20 kilos all the way to 37 kilos. Okay, so a relationship like this 
is shows us when we see data like this, this will not work. This is an unworkable relationship and we actually have to dig deeper into how are we going to model this relationship between protein and milk production. And just to back up what happens to all of that nitrogen, this is what I, I consider this a classic study. I love this data. And it's a real simple uh, design. This was out, out of uh, Glenn Broderick's lab at, at the Dairy Forage and Research Center at Madison, where all they did was increase the amount of diet crude protein. So you can see in the red, yes, as they increase protein, they increase nitrogen intake didn't really see a change in milk nitrogen output, and it was all related to manure nitrogen. And when we look at that even deeper, fecal nitrogen really didn't change, but it's all urinary nitrogen. Now, let's talk about that urinary nitrogen in terms of, especially here in the EU, with the nitrogen directive. And that's all, that's all related to emissions, both air quality and water quality. So th this is where we really have that potential to, by formulating better and getting most of these diets in this 14 to 16% crude protein range, if we want to go there, that we can really minimize our nitrogen excretion and maximize productivity of these cows. So the Cornell model, if we look at what a cow is, she is this, she's this amazing beast. Besides being this uber athlete, she also has the, this huge fermentation vessel that for years has always been treated kind of as a black box. And that's really where the Cornell model comes into is our primary focus is how do we model what's going on in that rumen to predict microbial yield? Because these cows, as we've learned over many years, we are limited in our productivity on these cows based on how much fermentable carbohydrates can we get down her throat and keep her healthy. So that gets into all sorts of things, fiber quality, fiber digestibility, starch digestibility, because it's all related to how much bacterial fermentation are we gonna get? And can we really get what is the maximum amount of amino acid flow to the cow that we can get out of the rumen. And in general, when we're talking herds, uh, regardless of level of production, we're gonna be between 40 and maybe 70% of the total amino acid flow is gonna be coming from microbial yield. So that's why there's been such this huge focus by the Cornell group over the years to try and get a handle on that predictability. She also has multiple uh, physiological needs. Uh, and that, that is, that all these different systems are competing for this supply of nutrients at the same time. So really, when we look at the Cornell model in most of these systems, INRA is the same, we're basically a giant accounting system. We're trying to account for all these different inputs, all these different variables, and come up with a way to give us a, a prediction, an accurate prediction, that we can go out and say, this diet, this cow, is gonna give us this level of milk production and be confident in that that is the result we're going to see. So when we look at where we start getting into some of the critical control points of using these models, for us with the Cornell model, there's two primary areas. When we talk about the requirement side, how we define the animal is critical. We're gonna go through some examples of that. And from the supply side, it's getting that feed chemistry right, these feed characteristics. Because really what we're doing with the model is this, we, we describe feeds by their fermentation kinetics. Okay, so we split things into pools. I don't care what formulation system you use. The single most important input, oh wait, how many of you are veterinarians? Okay, veterinarians. <laughs> My wife's a vet, so it's open season. Uh, how do you determine how much of an antibiotic to administer to a cow? 
Do you know body weight? Yeah. Body weight in all of these formulation systems is the most important input. Within the Cornell model, it touches every section except determining the protein and energy requirements for lactation. Okay, and yet we don't measure it on a daily basis or even on a weekly basis. Now, another unknown little fact is over time, because of genetics, we have selected for bigger cows, okay? A couple years ago, the Cornell uh, group went and they compared what the Cornell herd body weight was then versus in 1993. Same genetic selection program, same base forages, similar formulation strategy. So this is purely what has happened to this herd in terms of genetics. In 1993, the mature weight of the herd was 668 kilos. In 2016, 776. Folks, that's about a 1% per year increase in mature size. This is also happening with jerseys. Hell, we've got jerseys in the US now with mature sizes of 600, 620 kilos. For me to walk onto a jersey farm and see a 500 kilo average jersey size is pretty rare. Okay, we have selected for bigger cows because they give more milk, because they can eat more. Here's a cow, this was actually a cow on one of, one of the studies. She tipped the scale at 1,000 kilos. And if you look at her, it's kind of hard on screen there. She may be a body condition score three. She is just this big, deep-bodied beast who can eat and eat and eat and make lots of milk. And we've seen this, so even at home, we just went through on 800 cows, we have 77 cows right now that, are, that lifetime production is greater than, than 50,000 kilos, okay? These cows are just bigger, and if they survive, they can produce boatloads of milk. We also know, and this is great, I, I love this next slide because it shows some of the relationships. We, we forget about heifers. There's this awesome relationship between how much milk a first calf heifer is going to give and what, as a percentage of the mature herd, is the same relationship as a percentage of mature body size. This is actually from a study at Cornell, and this is week of trial, it's not even week of lactation. So on the, on the right, we've got milk. Those heifers were averaging 78% of the mature herd and they weighed 79% of the mature herd. One of the first things that I look at when I go on farm is this relationship. Because this tells me everything about how the heifer program is working. Because if they don't produce, and I'm thinking yesterday to some of the report, the results from some of these trials, where they weren't seeing a milk response in relation to in, in any treatment in the first calf heifers, the probability is those heifers were too small and actually were diverting all of that new, all those nutrients that should go to milk into increased body growth. A heifer is gonna grow to reach her next targeted weight before she's gonna produce milk. The other is, and, and this is, I think we're one of the only systems in the world that does this, is when we look at distances, how far do these cows walk? And when we get into grazing systems or dry lots, this number can get really big, really quick. This is an example. This is a 4,200 cow Jersey herd, dry lot dairy down in New Mexico. And if you look, so this is the milking center. Each of these is a, is a pen. And way down here are the late lactation cows. And you can see all those little black dots. That's jerseys, okay? They look like black, black dots from Google Earth. Uh, I won't make any other comments about those little barn rats. Um, they can be very good animals, though. Uh, so this is, I just did this with Google Earth, okay? And you can do this path measurement. So these cows going from the middle of the pen to the, to the parlor, 
500 meters one way, walking. This does not include her walking within the pen, going to eat or anything. This is just how far she's walking to be milked, one way. So twice a day milking, she's walking two kilometers a day back and forth from the parlor. We go to a smaller farm, we go home, 750 cows, three times a day milking, we're 600 meters total walking distance. Now, why is this important? The Australians, gotta love the Australians for doing stuff like this, uh, even though they can't play rugby. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, they put cows on treadmills and they actually determined what is the energy consumption for cows walking. And the way it works out is for every kilometer a cow walks on the flat, it's equivalent to about 500 mils of milk energy. All right, let's think about this in terms of pasture farms. Some of these pasture farms I've been on, are, are those cows are walking 10, 12, 16 kilometers a day. So massive amounts of energy being, being diverted from milk to maintenance energy because of activity. So we, again, we include this within the system. We also include environmental adjustments for heat stress, cold stress, uh, and they both impact the energy, the energy requirements as well as dry matter intake. And if we look at some things like how is the animal clean or dry? So if we look at a dry cow versus a, a heifer, is she in the wind or not? Okay, if we take it even at zero degrees, 100 kilo heifer that's out there, she's covered in mud and manure and wet, and she's out in the wind, her maintenance requirement went up 300%. What's gonna happen to her productive energy at this point, namely gain? She's not gonna gain, she's just gonna survive. Can we feed around this? A little bit, but in situations like this, it's really difficult. And we can't forget dry cows. That this is, this is actually, I took this picture a couple years ago in Argentina. It was 20 degrees out. It was a beautiful day. We're standing there looking at the calves on this farm and I turn around and I look and I see these dry cows out there in the sun, panting, fit, exhibiting clinical heat stress on a 20 degree day because they were in direct sunlight exposure. So I grabbed my little infrared camera and that poor cow, her skin temperature was 42 degrees, okay? So we need, when we describe these animals appropriately, we can try and formulate around this, but it also gives us an opportunity to go to the farm management and say, look, these cows are heat stressed, these dry cows. Here's the data showing what heat stress dry cows end up as. Let's talk about shade. And here's the impact that we can see. 10 minutes, okay, Ooh, okay. There's a few other inputs that are important. Uh, from minus 21 to plus 21 days, uh, we actually include a requirement for mammogenesis. So these discussions, these numbers we talk about in relation to uh, 1,200, 1,300 grams of MP in, in the close-up dry cow, part of that is that mammogenesis requirement that we actually are taking into account. If we look at the rumen model, this is the key, this is the, and this is what makes us a nonlinear model. We're trying to model things this, in, a comp, in a competitive function. Is it, it's a competition for a substrate, is it going to be digested in the rumen, or is it going to pass out of the rumen? So that gives us some unique things to consider. For example, starch and starch quality. And if we look at uh, for example, fresh grain versus fermented grain, we know there's this difference in total tract digestibility, and by using something like a seven-hour starch digestibility, we can then calculate a rate and come back and say, okay, this is how much is going to uh, actually degrade in the rumen. And it also gives us an opportunity to, to look at pricing of feeds. For example, instead of pricing feeds on total starch content, what if we price feed on a potential rumen degraded starch content? We get completely different answers, folks. If we look at corn, you know, here's whole corn, cracked, ground, 
steam rolled, steam flaked, and look at what happens to ruminal starch disappearance. We increase it. Now there's a processing cost, but if we can ferment more of that corn in the rumen, we're actually going to grow more bugs and we're gonna have more amino acid flow to the cow. Or we could go to something like ground barley. Now on a per ton basis, ground barley may be more expensive than corn, but when we look at it this way from a rumen degraded starch standpoint, ground barley might be significantly cheaper. If we look at an exam, oh no, let's skip that for time. There's been a lot of work by the Cornell Group the last 10 years on fiber digestibility, and we've implemented this, this three time points now to look at fiber digestibility instead of just using a single time point and a relationship with lignin. I used to say this was the worst forage I've ever seen. The farm then, I told the farm, uh, this is a farm out of Wales. I told them a few weeks ago that I actually have one worse. Um, so in this case, if we use the old lignin relationship, it's saying that 30% of the NDF is in, in, indigestible to the rumen. But if we use these new methods, which is actually using a 30, a 120, and a 240 hour NDF digestibility, we actually find that 62% of the NDF in this forage was indigestible to the cow. So that's a huge difference in terms of potential dry matter intake, and potential amino acid flow from microbial yield from the fermentation of this forage. We can also do the same with, with, with non-forages using different time points, but this really allows us to see the, this relationship between digestible and indigestible, and then how quickly this, and this potentially digestible NDF degrades. So we use these feed fractions within the model. They're, they're similar in concept to what the NRC and, and feed into milk and other systems use, this concept of ABC, where A is rapidly degradable in the room and C is unavailable and B mild, moderate to slowly degradable in the rumen. And we just use feed chemistry to break these down. So for example, on carbohydrates, what we call A4 is sugars, B3 digestible NDF, and then C is the UNDF, the 240 hour. Oh, let's get that one too. But it doesn't matter because on farm, folks, if we really want to improve how these farms perform every day, we got to get farms to be doing their own dry matters on silages. Damn it, even a 200 cow farm should be doing, doing it at least twice a week. Larger farms, we should be talking three to seven times a week doing dry matters on their silages. Simplest thing in the world. Uh, this is a mathematical uh, approach uh, to look at what are the important feed components, okay? So in this case, if we look at energy allowable milk, we see that NDF, 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 lignin, lignin, okay, these, these are the most sensitive feed chemistry inputs to predicting energy allowable milk. But look at this on the protein side. So this is MP allowable milk. Okay, total pool size of protein, NDF, 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 lignin, starch. Again, it comes back to how much carbohydrates can we stuff into her to maximize room and fermentation. Similar type thing with the degradation rates where it is the fiber digestibility, the starch digestibility for both energy and protein that are the most related to, to what the potential milk production is. So regardless, we have very similar ranking for what are the most important feed analytes to use. And just as an example of what impact the, these rates and digestibilities can do, this is just a real simple example looking at different types of corn processing. So same diet, the only thing I changed here was how was, were, you, were we using ground corn or steam flaked corn? So it's the same amount, 1.2 kilos of cornmeal or 1.2 kilos of flaked corn. If we look over here, we can see there is about a uh, two kilo difference in potential milk production simply by changing starch processing. Okay, again, 
what can we do from a what if scenario? So this, you saw this yesterday from Chuck with the amino acid composition of tissue, milk, and bugs. Um, and I, I always like this one because this, this one really gets us thinking about what are we going to do with amino acid formulation. If we look at the relationship between milk protein concentration and milk yield, there's really no relationship there. But if we look at that same relationship between milk yield and milk protein yield, there's a very strong relationship, okay? Now, part of the reason is whey proteins are a secondary osmotic regulator to milk volume. So as we increase milk protein yield, we're either going to slightly change milk protein concentration, but we're more likely going to see an increase in volume to keep that osmotic pressure uh, equivalent for, for the mammary gland. So if we look at the relationship between, this is total, total grams of lysine, metabolizable lysine, total grams of methionine, MP methionine, and with protein yield, we see there's a really good relationship. So that really shows us in diets where we're most likely one of these two amino acids limited, as we increase gram, total grams even of metabolizable methionine and or metabolizable lysine, we're going to see an increase in milk protein yield. Now, over the last few years, Cornell has been evaluating how to look at things a little differently with amino acids. How many of you have ever done poultry or swine nutrition? Okay, now if I ask one of you, tell me what intake is of a 50 kilo pig. What are you going to reply with? You're gonna reply with this much energy. For years, the monogastric industry has talked about intake and amino acids in relation to energy. In ruminants, we were always taught dry matter intake in, other, in something like amino acids or MP or energy. But really, when we look at these, amino acids and energy are pretty tightly regulated. And when Cornell went through and was deriving some, the next generation of the model, they started looking at things this way. We actually find that when we look at glycine in relationship to energy, okay, and versus the efficiency of use of th those amino acids, that there's a really, really tight relationship, which is great because now we can start formulating around this. So to maximize milk protein yield, we're talking about a lysine, so this is grams of metabolizable lysine per mcal of ME intake. In this case, for lysine, to maximize milk protein yield, we're talking about a three to one relationship. When we talk about lysine, it's even with methionine, it's an even stronger relationship. And we wanna to maxim to maximize milk protein yield, we're gonna be around 1.15 grams of methionine per mcal of ME. And it's interesting in that I've kind of evolved to that same level in my prepartum diets and have gotten amazing results. Now that does mean that I'm supplementing methionine in almost every diet. Uh, and you have to keep in mind, though, that different methionine sources can give us different results. This is a little trial I did when I was consulting for a company almost 20 years ago. So the control diet and then either product A or product B, we can see that both of them reduced MUN. We can see that both of them increased milk fat. And we can see that with product B, we actually got a higher milk protein concentration response than product A, okay? At this point, it's like product A looks great, or product B looks great. Until we look at this, when we look at milk yield, product A actually gave us a greater milk volume response. And when we look at grams of milk fat and grams of milk protein, they're the same. So at the end of the day, it's a question of how is the farm paid for milk? If they're paid per kilo of fat and protein, it doesn't matter. If they're paid for volume and a concentration response, maybe a different decision. So we have to be aware that some of these products will respond differently. Now I will say, in this case, product A and product B are from the same company, 
and there's only one company that has two methionine products on the market. So it doesn't take much to figure out what company <clears throat> at a sale it is, okay? And we have to remember, amino acids are required. We look at not only the production response, but we have to be thinking about immune function and reproduction. The, these are just, to some people, they're added benefits. I think we're getting enough data now that we'll be able to create an immune submodel to really show how much energy and amino acids are being pulled for adequate immune function. So first things first with any of these models, and I tell people this too, I am not a ruminant, I'm not a cow nutritionist. First and foremost, I'm a microbial nutritionist. I'm gonna do everything I can do to maximize rumen flows, and then I supplement what the cow requires. We wanna make sure that we have good inputs, that we're maximizing fermentable carbohydrates, we wanna keep enough PENDF to keep the rumen healthy, supply adequate ammonia and some degradable protein to keep the bugs happy, and then supplement with appropriate ingredients be it bypass proteins, amino acids, fats, whatever, to reach the targeted level of production that we want. And with that, thank you very much for being here, and if you have questions. <laughs> <laughs>